A lot of you uh, did a little traveling perhaps over spring break. For some of us, spring break is just another week, but maybe you did some traveling or whatever. Well, let's suppose that my wife and I decide that we're going to run up to Amarillo for some reason. And so we get ready to go to Amarillo, but all of a sudden I'm feeling tired and I say, you know, honey, I need to take a nap. And so I crawl in the passenger seat and, and I'm taking a nap and she's driving and I wake up and we're in Clovis, New Mexico. And I say, where are we? And she said, well, we're in Clovis. And I said, well, I thought we were going to Amarillo. And she said, well, we are. And I said, no, no, we're going to Santa Fe, you know, if we, if we keep this up. And so at that moment, we need to make a mid-course correction. And so we turn there at Clovis, and we head up to Hereford, and then we go to Amarillo. If we would have kept going that other way, we never would have got to Amarillo. <laughs> Folks, it's like that in the spiritual life. We have a destination. We are to be more like Christ. That's what he has called us to be and to do. And so we have got to make sure we're on target. Because if we are trying to move that direction, but we're going another direction, we're never going to get where we need to be. And this happens so often in the Christian life. People come to Christ and their sins are washed away and they get a new start. But then somewhere along the way, they begin to take a, a little turn, a twist, and they head off in the wrong direction. And they're not going the direction they need to go. And so what they need to do is to make a mid-course correction. We call it repentance. We call it a change of mind. You turn and you start going the direction that you need to be going. And it happens all the time. In the book of Colossians, chapter 1, where we'll be this morning, in the book of Colossians, Paul is writing to a relatively new church. Epaphras had gone to Colossae, and he had won people to Jesus, and they had won more people to Jesus, and, and they were gathered together, and they became a church. You've always got to have a church. And so they were gathered together, maybe not a church like this, they were probably meeting in a house, but they were coming together and they were trying to grow and be more like Christ. But very early in their existence, some things had crept in and they began to get off course. We're going to see over the next few weeks as we look at this book and uh, there were all kinds of things that were creeping in, a human tradition and vain philosophies and the veneration of angels and, and uh, asceticism and ceremonialism and all kinds of stuff began to come in. And what was happening is what often happens in our life. Jesus, who was center stage, he was in the spotlight and all of a sudden other things began to crowd him off. Now, they didn't, they didn't uh, want Jesus to be totally out of their life, but he, he sort of got pushed to the side and other things began to be center stage. And Paul writes them and says, oh, we got to make a mid-course correction here. Because anytime Jesus is not the very center of life and faith, then something has gone wrong. I've seen that happen over and over and over again. I've been in ministry long enough now to I've seen a lot of things come and go. I, when I first got into ministry, there was a big thing going on about spiritual gifts. Now, there's nothing wrong with spiritual gifts. The Bible talks about them. But they're not center stage. And then another fad that came along was that of angels. And everybody had little pictures of angels and this and that. And everybody was preaching on angels, talking about angels. Nothing wrong with that. Angels are biblical. They're ministering spirits sent by God. But they're not in the center then there have been other things. Prophecy from time to time. Uh, some, some people just get so enthralled with prophecy they can't think about anything else. Now, there's nothing wrong with prophecy. And the Bible has got prophecy and we need to study it. But it's not center stage. In the last few years, there's been a, a, a very specific theological persuasion called Calvinism. And for some people, that has taken center stage. Now, let me tell you something, folks. There's two JCs in the Christian world. There's Jesus Christ and there's John Calvin. And John Calvin can't hold a candle to Jesus Christ. 
All right? And so none of these things that want to push Jesus Christ out of the very center of our faith and our practice, our doctrine, our life, none of those things are where we need to be. And anytime we find ourselves more enthralled with a secondary issue or a tertiary issue, anytime we get more enthralled with that than with our Lord and our Savior Jesus who died for us and rose from the dead for us, then we got a real problem and we need to get back on course. That is what the book of Colossians is about. And we're going to start this morning, jump right into it and get the introduction and uh, the introduction, introductory matters. And then we're going to begin to see how we get back on course and how we help others. You may be thinking right now, in your mind, you're thinking about somebody else and you say, yeah, you know what? They're off course. Uh, maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's a friend, somebody you work with, somebody you go to school with, whatever. And you're thinking about them, and you, they, they were walking with the Lord at one time, but now they're off course. And so how are they going to get back? We're going to see this morning how Paul approached this task of bringing these people back online, back in the trail, refocusing them where they needed to be. And you and I can use this as well. Let's see the text. Colossians chapter 1, beginning with verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timothy our brother to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are at Colossae. Grace to you and peace from God our Father. We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints. Saints means a holy one and that's what Christians called each other. You have love for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel which has come to you just as in all the world that is constantly bearing fruit and increasing even as it has been doing in you since the first day you heard of it and you understood the grace of God in truth just as you learned it from Epaphras our beloved fellow bondservant, who is a faithful servant of Christ on our behalf, and he has also informed us of your love in the Spirit. For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience, joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. In this passage, we see how Paul begins to bring these people that he's never even met but he begins to bring them back online. He helps them with a mid-course correction, and he gets them going in the right direction. Now, how does he do it, and how do we do it? Most of us who had children at one time or another, they got off course. They needed to be brought back in the line. You've got friends. They began to stray away after other things. Family, wh whatever. Somebody needs a mid-course correction. How did Paul do it, and how do we do it? We start with this, prayer. Notice what he says in this passage. He says, we're always praying for you. I have not ceased to pray for you. Here's these people in another town that he's never met, but he hears about them. They've come to faith, but they're getting a little off track. And so what does he do? First thing he does is pray. And folks, you know me well enough to know that that's what I always tell you to do. You come to me and say, Pastor, I got this problem. I say, well, the first thing we got to do is pray about it. I heard of a liberal politician this last week, and after the horrible thing that happened in New Zealand, a crazy man goes in and kills at least 50 people. You know, folks, just let me remind you, the Bible says we don't hate our enemies, we love our enemies. You remember that? And he goes in and he kills 50 people. And a liberal politician in our country said this. He said, she said, I'm tired of talking about 
Our thoughts and prayers are with you. She said, what good do thoughts and prayers do? We need to take action. Now, I don't argue with the fact sometimes we need to take action. It needs to be the right action. But folks, it is never good to disparage praying. To say, well, what good does that do? Well, you and I as believers, if we believe in an all-powerful God who rules heaven and earth, who can do anything, who knows everything, if we believe in that kind of God, and I do, and I believe you do too, then praying is incredibly important. So we need to pray. How do we pray? Well, first of all, we pray for ourselves. Now, that's not in the text, but it's in the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus tells his disciples, you know what? There's a lot of people out there and they're, they've kind of gotten off course and they've got specks in their eyes. And if you've ever had a speck in your eye, you know, it's nice for somebody to get it out. It's really troublesome. But Jesus said, before you ever do that, make sure there's not a plank in your eye. And so when we're thinking about, you know, there's somebody off track and and we want to try to help them. Jesus teaches us the first thing you pray about is yourself. The first thing you do is you go to God and you say, Lord God, I, I do see these other people and they've got some problems. But Lord, what I can't see as clearly is my own problems. You ever heard something called a blind spot? Sometimes you're driving and you start to change lanes and you about another car honks at you. They were in your blind spot. You didn't see it. Well, sometimes in our spiritual lives, there are blind spots and we're going along and we think we are just doing great. We think we're absolutely on the right course. But really, as we see God involved, we're on the wrong course. When we see from God's perspective, we're on the wrong course. Now, they've got an issue over there and we don't need to worry about that. Okay, we're, we're right here. Okay. So we don't want to, we don't want to, have this blind spot and miss out on what God's trying to do in our life while we're so worried about somebody else. Yes, we want to take care of people. Yes, we, we do want to deal with them. But first of all, we have got to look at our life. And we've got to ask God to help us because, you know what, a lot of times we'll just overlook our own deals. We'll think we're just fine. It's all those other people that need to change, Right. Well, the first thing we do is we pray and we say, God, what do you need to show me about me before I try to help somebody else? All right. So we pray. We pray for ourselves and then we pray without ceasing. We pray and just keep on praying. In verse three, Paul says, when he's thinking about these people that are drifting off, he says, we're praying always for you. And then down in verse 9, it says, since we heard about you and your faith, it's a wonderful thing. And we have not ceased to pray for you. In 1 Thessalonians, Paul says, pray without ceasing. Jesus says, men ought always to pray and not lose heart. So Paul is not talking about a one and done. He's talking about you keep on, you keep on, you keep on, you keep on praying. We got to keep on. And so Paul says, when I think about you and I'm so excited about the good things, but I'm thinking about the ways you're getting off track. And so what I'm going to do very first of all, I'm going to pray for you and I'm going to keep on praying for you. Now, you might say, well, pastor, you know, I, I would like to pray for those other people, but I, I just don't have time. I'm so busy. I've got my my family to take care of and my job and all my responsibilities and and I don't have time to pray. Well, Paul said he prayed all the time. I don't have time to do that. Listen, probably nobody any busier than Paul. Here was a man who got the church started, basically, in the Mediterranean world. He wrote a huge part of the New Testament. And yet here was a man who was not too busy to pray. Now you say, well, how did he do it? Well, he did it as he was doing other things. He was always traveling, sailing here, sailing there, walking here. And no doubt, as he did that, he was praying. Sometimes he had to make tents because he wasn't depending on other people to send him money. Sometimes they did, but if they didn't, he made tents. And while he's making a tent and stitching it together, he's praying. And he's teaching us that we can do that too. See, folks, sometimes there's times when you're doing something else, but you can pray at the same time. 
You're driving to work. Now keep your eyes open, please. Okay. But you're driving to work and you can pray. You go on the way to work and you're praying for your boss. They were really grumpy yesterday. You're praying that I'll do a good job. You're praying that 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 person that you work next to, that they do not know Jesus Christ, but you're praying for them. While you're going to work, you're praying. While you're doing the dishes, you're praying. While you're mowing the grass, you're praying. Maybe you turn that television off or get off the internet or put up that video game or whatever, and you pray. Because, folks, listen, we, we are all hard-headed and sometimes hard-hearted and we need God to change us, and we need God to change those other people too. And just talking with them won't do it. But we have to pray without ceasing. We keep on, keep on, keep on praying for them. And you got somebody in your life that's just troubling you right now, and you wake up in the night, and you're worried about them. Instead of worrying, pray for them. We pray. We pray for ourselves, and we pray without ceasing. Here's the fourth thing. We pray with thanksgiving. Now look in verse 3. He says, we give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Part of his prayer was thanksgiving. He teaches at the end of the passage down in verse 12 that we need to give thanks to the Father. He said in chapter 4, he said, be devoted uh, in your prayer. You're devoted and you're giving thanks. And then in other places in this book, he talks about giving thanks. Now you say, well, pastor, if somebody is off course and we're trying to get them back on course, then how in the world do we give thanks in that? Here, here's what. Being thankful in our prayer life, even when we're praying for people's problems, helps, up to, helps us to keep things in proper perspective. If we only think about what's wrong, we get weighed down and burdened. We become negative. But if we think about the good things as well, then it helps us to have better balance in our life. So even when you're praying about somebody and they got a really serious problem, you ought also to include thanksgiving for some really good things. For example, let's say you're praying for your boss at work. And your boss is grumpy and they don't know Jesus. Okay? And so you're praying for them to come to Christ and their, boss, and their, their attitude be turned around. You're praying for them. But also you should give thanks for that person because, hey, they give you a job. Because there's bound to be something good about, thank you, Lord God, that, that my boss, even though they're not a Christian, my boss makes good decisions. He or she keeps this company on track, and, and I've got a job because of them, and so I give you thanks for that. And, Lord, I also give you thanks that even though he or she, they're not a Christian, they're nice to their spouse. I've seen them do that. Thank you, God, for that. So even as we're praying about the negative things, we're also thanking God for some positive things. Look at the things he gives thanks for. He said, I'm praying always for you, and in verse 4, I'm giving thanks for your faith. You believe. And your love, which you have for all the people. You, you love. You're drifting off course a little bit, but you still believe in Jesus. And you're loving the other brothers and sisters. And in verse 5, he said, and I give thanks for your hope. The hope that's laid up for you in heaven. 1 Corinthians 13 talks about faith, hope, and love. And here he talks about the same thing. He gives thanks that they're being fruitful. Now, maybe not as fruitful as they need to be, but we'll talk about that in a moment. But he gives thanks. And we've got to learn to give thanks for people as well. There was a time, I've told you before, I was really praying for my boys. They were not going the right direction. And I was trying to pray, oh God, please bring them back into good direction. But even as I was doing that, I could still give thanks there's so many good qualities that they had. Mostly they got them from their mother, okay? But they had some really good qualities, and we could give thanks for those. Lord, I thank you for my youngest. He, he is incredibly hard-headed. He's, he's, uh, he's determined. 
But, Lord God, when that starts going in the right direction, it's going to be fantastic. So you give thanks at the same time you're praying for the changes that need to be made. Now, who are you praying for right now? Is it all about their negatives or, or are there some positive things? Here's something positive. Lord, I thank you that no matter where that person is, you're big enough to change them. I give you thanks for that. So in the midst of all our prayer, even when we're needing things to change, we give thanks to God. And then one more thing. We pray. We pray for ourselves first because we haven't arrived. We pray without ceasing because not just some little quick, quickie prayer is probably not going to get it done. We pray with gratitude because not everything is bad. Not everything is wrong. But finally, we do pray for change and for growth. And that's what he begins to do in verse 9. And you're going to see the rest of the book, he's having to correct these people and bring them back into line. But he's praying. And as he prays, he prays for God to bring them in a better direction. What does he pray for? Well, he prays, first of all, that they'll be knowledgeable. We have not ceased to pray for you, verse 9, and ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will. He prays for them to be knowledgeable. Part of the reason they're getting off course is they're thinking incorrectly. You know, bad belief leads to bad behavior. And so he's praying, Lord, let them know the way you want life to be lived. Let them know. Give them your wisdom, Lord, and your understanding. And what we're going to see a little bit later in the book is that in Jesus Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So he's saying, Lord, let them know you better and better. And as they know you, as they know Jesus Christ, then they'll begin to have better understanding of everything else going on around them. As they know Jesus better and better, they're going to understand nothing needs to take center stage from Jesus Christ. So they pray for them to be knowledgeable. He also prays for them to be honorable and respectable. Now look, he says... I'm praying for them, verse 14, or verse 10, excuse me, so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Understand this, folks. There was a time in your life when you just go along through life and Jesus spoke to you and he drew you by his spirit and you said yes to him. And at that moment, if, if it was real, if your faith was real, at that moment, you became a Christian. You bear a wonderful name. But we are to live worthy of that name. I don't know if you've ever had experience in life where your children were really off the rails and they were doing horrible things and you talk to your children and say, you're bringing shame on the family name. Now we can do that as Christians too. We go tell around, telling people we are Christians and yet we live in these wrong ways and it's bringing shame on the name of Jesus Christ. And Paul said, walk in a manner worthy. So he's praying for them to live respectable and honorable Christian lives. And then he's praying for them to be fruitful. He says again in verse 10, bearing fruit in every good work. Do you understand it's not enough just in your head to say, I believe in Jesus? Doesn't James say faith without works is dead? And so when you really come to know Jesus Christ, it's not going to stop here in your head, but it's going to move in your heart the way you feel about people, and it's going to flow out to your hands, and you're going to be living in such a way that you're bearing fruit. You're bringing other people to Christ. You're ministering to people. You're serving Jesus Christ. Not to get to heaven, but because he has transformed your life and you are serving him. You're bearing fruit. And Paul prays for these people. Lord, I want them to be fruitful. Then he also prays for them to be powerful. He said in verse 11, strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. Not your own strength, work it up, but plug into Jesus. And when you do, his strength flows into you and you have power for living. He's praying that. 
And then he also prays for them to be joyful and to be thankful. And he's praying for correction in their life. Lord God, I, I hear about these folks over in Colossae. They've come to you. But Lord, they're drifting off course. So I'm praying. And I'm going to write. But before I do, I'm praying. And I'm praying. And I'm praying. Because they need to get right with you. Now listen. This morning. There's probably somebody in your life, somebody that touches your life, family member, work associate, friend, and you see them drifting off. Now, you want to be really, really careful. Lord God, am I drifting off? What do I need to see? Am I missing something here? Is it me instead of them? But you've prayed that and you see them drifting off and it's obvious and it's obvious to the people around you. This person's taking a bad direction. What do you do? You pray. Oh, you're going to talk. You're going to speak. Paul's going to tell them. But first you pray. And you pray. And you pray. That God would open their eyes. That God would speak to their minds and let them see what they're doing is wrong. That God would work in their lives and cause them to live honorable lives. And you pray. Because when we get off and we're headed in the wrong direction, listen, somebody sitting down having a nice little talk with you is probably not going to do it. You're going to need some head change and some heart change and some changing of the will before you line up in the right direction. About four years ago, in March, there was a German airliner took off in Barcelona, I believe, and it was headed back for Germany. Had uh, 150 people on board, crew, passengers, and everybody. And the pilot got up, and he stepped out of the cockpit for a few moments, not knowing that at that moment his co-pilot was having mental problems and even suicidal thoughts. As the pilot leaves the cockpit, the co-pilot bolts the door shut, shuts the door, and changes the course of the plane. It had been on a course that was going to take them safely back to Germany, but he changed the course of that plane, and he headed that plane directly at some of the French Alps. And they tried desperately to get back in, but they could not, and that plane at full speed rammed inside, rammed into the side of a mountain. Now listen, mountains don't move. And all that was left of that plane were pieces scattered all over the side. What happened? The wrong course led to destruction. Folks, sometimes we get a little off course and it's just going to delay us getting there. We're going to correct and it's going to be okay. But other times we get off course and it's going to destroy us. Or it's going to destroy somebody out there that you know. And so it's incredibly important that we get back on course. Or they get back on course before there's nothing left but devastation. You probably know somebody today. That's flying in the wrong direction. Maybe it's you. And there needs to be a mid-course correction. Before it's too late. Would you bow with me this morning just for a moment? We bow this morning. And as you do. First of all. Talk to God about yourself. Lord God am I going the right direction? Now, we all think we are, but sometimes we fool ourselves. And so ask God, Lord, please show me if I'm not. If I'm headed in the wrong direction, if I'm off course, please show me. Lord, I want to correct that course. Pray for yourself. Lord God, if I've got a plank in my own eye, help me to get that out so I can really help somebody else.
And then pray for other people. You know some. They've got serious issues. They need to make some changes. And they probably can't see it. Do you understand that? They can't see it. So you're going to have to ask God to open their eyes. Lord, God, help them. Lord, they're in some things that are clearly outside your scripture. They're doing some things. They, they know they're wrong. Lord, help them. Help them change. Pray. Pray without ceasing. Pray for God to correct their course. Our Father, all of us have been off course at one time or another. We were off course and you brought us to yourself and you changed our lives and you put our feet on a, a new path. But Lord, even then, sometimes we deviate off of it and it's easy and we get fooled. So Lord, we ask by your mercy and, and by your grace that you would continue to show us when we are drifting off. Even a little bit that we're drifting off, help us. And then, Lord God, we pray for people that we know and we care about. And they're, maybe they've taken a bad wrong course and they can't see it. And we pray that you'll show them. And Lord, help us to pray until it becomes obvious to them and they're ready to change. Father, help us as we look at this book to, to examine our own lives and to make the changes that you call us to and the corrections that you call for. And so we pray for every bit of this this morning in Jesus' name.